Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I um, please, I, I will have to ask your uh, indulgence and apologize um, in not standing for you, um, but I'm coming off of a, a very contentious grade appeal. Um, so we'll try to see if we can get it done um, this way. Um, it, it is um, indeed, uh, as always, a, a pleasure uh, for me to welcome you to the now 32nd annual Isaac Marks Memorial Lecture, uh, our oldest and most venerable uh, endowed lectureship. Uh, the Marks Lecture was conceived to enhance and enrich our regular curriculum, and therefore the depth and quality of the overall academic and educational experience um, for our students. So um, I'm very pleased to see so many students um, in attendance here today. Um, and in that role of uh, this lectureship, um, to enrich your experience, I think over 32 years it's fair to say that this series um, has um, succeeded without question. In addition, like all of our distinguished lecture series, the Marx Lecture always brings many members of both the rest of the university community that sometimes acknowledges that the law school is part of the university community, um, and the public, uh, the practicing and professional communities to the college. And we're always really very happy to welcome you here as well as uh, uh, an essential part of what we take very seriously, which is our mission, uh, part of our mission to be an intellectual and cultural resource in our community and in our state. Last, but hardly least, these lectures also pay appropriate tribute to the special esteemed individuals in whose names they were established and our expressions of the generosity of the very special people that created them. Now, the Marx Memorial Lecture was established in 1979 by Selma Paul Marx and her late husband, the Honorable Jack Marx, to honor the memory of Judge Marx's father, Isaac Marx. Now, I urge you if you, I see a lot of veterans here, but I urge you if you are new to this lectureship, to inform yourself about the background uh, of the Marx family and the Marx Memorial Lecture by reading the material on the inside folder of the brochure um, about this extraordinary family. Now, you'll notice in the brochure, it does tell you that Selma Paul Marx graduated from the Law College in 1956. What the brochure does not tell you, at least I don't think it tells you, is that not only was Selma the only female graduate in that class, but she managed to accomplish that feat while balancing the demands of law school with the responsibilities of being both a full-time wife and mother. I don't have to tell you, in the mid-1950s, this was almost unheard of, but totally characteristic of Selma. Selma herself went on to a distinguished career in law, first with a legal aid office in Tucson and later as a prosecutor in the Pima County Attorney's Office. As always, I'm delighted Selma could be with us this evening. Uh, she truly is a warm, caring individual with uh, a, a charming, one might even say delightfully wicked sense of humor. And, and I'm going to prove that to you because just a short time ago, we were up in my office chatting and I was apologizing to Selma that because of my physical situation, I, I was going to be unable to join um, the very nice dinner that, that follows um, this lectureship. And I told someone I was very sorry. I said, really, but 
by that point in the day, I wouldn't be much fun at all. And she looked at me without missing a beat and said, what made you think you would be much fun even if you weren't in all this pain? Um, nonetheless, or perhaps because of comments like that, I've grown quite fond um, of Selma, as almost everyone who meets her does. And um, although I know she doesn't like this, um, I am going to ask her to stand and be recognized. Selma? And Selma is here with her son, um, Buddy Paul, um, and his wife, Beverly, who uh, un unfortunately was unable to make it because she came down with a fairly serious um, fever. But Buddy is here, and we're always um, thrilled to welcome you back for this lectureship, too. Buddy, thank you. The um, purpose of the Marx Lecture is to bring to our college the scholarship and erudition of eminent persons engaged in various fields of topical importance in society, both in the law and beyond. And over its now 30 plus year history, this lectureship has lived up to that lofty goal, as you can see from the truly illustrious list of past speakers who are listed um, inside of the program you received when you came in. There's no need for me to read that list to you, but what is certainly worth mentioning is that this afternoon, this 32-year tradition of excellence continues as we welcome Carol Sanger, one of the country's foremost scholars in the fields of family law, gender, and contracts. Um, Professor Sanger is currently the Barbara Ehrenstein Black Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, where she teaches interdisciplinary courses on both motherhood and abortion. She has also presented on reproduction and related topics at uh, prestigious institutions, academic institutions, truly around the world. And while in recent years widely known for her work on reproductive rights, she is also an editor of one of, if not the leading, contracts case books in the country, almost rivaling in popularity my own, um, and Professor Browker's. And speaking of Professor Browker, um, Professor Sanger is in the midst of editing a book in the field along with Jean Browker um, on our faculty. Um, in addition to her full-time position at Columbia, Professor Sanger also holds an appointment as a senior research fellow at St. Anne's College, Oxford, that's England, not Mississippi, um, where she actually most recently has come to us from, where she's spending the semester. Um, and because I know that you came here to hear her, and not me, um, I'm not even going to begin to regale you with her many accomplishments other than to say a small sampling are detailed in the brochure. What I will tell you is that she honors us with her presence here this evening to deliver the 32nd annual Marx Lecture on a very topical and a very controversial and important subject about abortion, meaning, and methodology, Professor Sanger. It is a great pleasure to be giving the 32nd Marx Memorial Lecture and to join the list of distinguished lecturers who've given this uh, before. The word distinguished doesn't quite capture their eminence, and it's an honor to be counted among them. Um, I uh, appreciate the importance of this lecture, and I just came here from Washington, D.C., where I was visiting my mother, and I wanted to explain it to her. And it's sometimes hard for the families of academics to understand what we do or that we do anything, <laughs> um, and also what counts as success. 
I recall that I once gave my grandmother a newly an off print of a Law Review article I had just written, and I heard overheard her telling one of her friends with huge pride, Carol has written another pamphlet for the school magazine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I told my mom about coming here, and I had the last year's uh, brochure and showed it to her. I, I tried to put it in the currency of the realm, and I said, you know how you always want me, on the tr me to be on the Charlie Rose show? She said, yes. I said, this is better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so many thanks for making my mother so happy. And I want especially to thank Mrs. Marks for her commitment to enriching the law school community in this way, and also through the many kindnesses that have been extended to me uh, from the moment I was invited. I wanted to say I was very excited to learn, or pleased to learn, that Judge Marks had been, was a Columbia Law School graduate. And I know he would like this connection. But I wanted to point out that I might be the right person to honor Isaac Marks as well. For I am what is, in, what is sometimes called a mixed marriage. I teach at Columbia, and my husband teaches at NYU. Um, <laughs> so both of the alma maters are partially represented. And finally, I wanted to say that I take quite seriously the description of both Jack and Isaac as having practiced and served the law with distinction. And that is the mark I aim for today. So my subject this afternoon is abortion, a subject that for the last 40 years has embedded itself in American consciousness, American politics, and American culture with remarkable durability and reach. <clears throat> Looking only at the first decade of this century, from George W. Bush to Barack Obama, uh, abortion has been central to how Americans conceptualize, debate, and sometimes resolve all sorts of things. Uh, foreign aid, health care reform, high school sex education, nominations to the Supreme Court. Abortion has been at the heart of disputes over what products Walmart keeps on its shelf, over whether Super Bowl fans should watch or boycott the uh, halftime uh, ad uh, advertisements, and what health care services are available to pregnant service women serving abroad. Reliably divisive, the subject is never far out of sight. It stands at the ready to stir the pot, or depending on one's point of view, to bring sudden clarity to whatever issue is under discussion. Each year brings new controversies over something to do with abortion. Some involve popular culture. Uh, most recently, the question was, um, should, the, should the comic strip Doonesbury be carried on the funnies page, or should it be moved to the editorial page, or should it be canceled altogether following the five-day sequence it ran on mandatory ultrasound, in which it quoted only direct quotes from what politicians actually said. Um, OK. Um, <laughs> There's also, um, there, abortion also attaches to long-standing uh, uh, issues of tension in the United States, such as those around race. In 2011, a huge billboard appeared in Manhattan featuring a black child above the caption, the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. This was part of a larger pro-life outreach pro campaign to minority communities uh, denouncing legal abortion as part of a genocidal plan. So things seem to be about abortion, even when the connection to abortion may not be entirely clear. Consider the ban on Stelsem research, a bomb at the Atlanta Olympics, Terry Schiavo. And in some cases, the connection may not even be entirely accurate. The announcement by the Sur Surgeon General in 2003 that abortion causes breast cancer, or the Freakonomics claim that legalizing abortion uh, lowered the crime rate. There is also a public contestation over the question of whether a particular issue has anything to do with abortion at all. One example concerns the enactment in recent years of what are called missing angel acts, uh, a kind of legislation that began here in Arizona. Um, these are statutes which authorize the state to is issue birth certificates for stillborn infants if the parents request one. The acts resulted from lobbying by bereaved parents who have argued that fetal death certificates, the form of documentation that traditionally accompanies stillbirth, failed to capture the true nature of their loss, that they had lost a child. Despite enormous sympathy for the parents, concerns were raised that creating birth certificates for, birth certificates for children who never lived, certificates commemorating life before and in the absence of death, 
might eventually play a part in the ongoing campaign against abortion. Missing Angel supporters insisted that the legislation is not about abortion, but only about providing them with official form of solace. But the concern remained that it may no longer be possible to cabin or the cultural or political meaning of anything to do with abortion, with, pardon me, with fetal life or death in the United States. So what's going on? Why is so much in the US about abortion? Um, I, I want to argue that so many things are about abortion in the US because abortion itself is about so many things. And I want to set out in the beginning of this lecture the central categories into which abortion falls as a way of understanding how much is at stake when people talk about or around the issue. Um, and I must say that when you talk about um, abortion regulation in the United States to people outside the US, they often think they haven't heard you right and they, that the issue should be more settled than it is. And so one of the points I want to underscore is that it's quite interesting that here it remains an open issue. We haven't ever reached an accord on it despite um, the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling. So let me say at the beginning that um, abortion is probably in the first instance considered to be a medical procedure. And within the medical, research, and public health communities, it's an important aspect of obstetric care. The characterization of abortion as medical is important in other non-clinical ways. It matters to how abortion is treated at law. For like other forms of medical care, abortion is subject to regulation as part of the state's uh, police power, as those of you who've taken con law will know. Um, of course, the regulation of abortion is not quite the same as that of medical, other medical procedures. Since the development of a robust pro-life movement following the decision in 73, abortion has become the most regulated medical procedure in the United States. Much of the regulation is geared toward making abortion harder to get, since it can't be prohibited, making it harder to get financially, practically, and emotionally. Thus, I want to make a distinction between abortion as a medical issue and what we might think of as the medicalization of abortion. And by that, I mean um, treating non-medical aspects of abortion as though they were, in fact, medical in order to regulate them. Um, as one federal judge explained, in many places, burdensome regulations micromanaging everything from elevator safety to countertop varnish to the location of the janitor's closets have made abortions effectively unavailable, if not technically illegal. The other example I think that's even clearer is the transformation of what we are familiar with in, in uh, the regulation of med medicine, medical treatment, uh, informed consent. But abortion has um, made informed consent transform itself, I think, from medically informed consent to something closer to morally informed consent. And this is, a, this, is a, this is a distinction that we might want to pay attention to. Abortion is also about rights. We know that in Roe, the Supreme Court said the constitutional right of privacy was broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. And in states where abortion had been illegal, the law was not about rights or medicine. It was about crime and all that follows from defining an act as criminal, surveillance of abortion patients, prosecution, testimony, and punishment of abortion providers, though interestingly in the US, not of women themselves. Um, in some ways, I think abortion is still about crime, even though the procedure itself is no longer Ill criminal. As a matter of politics, its legality seems ever up for grabs. And in many ways, abortion is still associated with crime as sidewalk protesters or counselors, depending on your point of view, plead with patients not to kill their babies, and as abortion providers themselves are shot and killed. Abortion is also about other claims to rights. Some of Roe's most ferocious opponents are defenders of states' rights, who contend that the legal status of abortion should have remained a matter for state legislatures and not federal courts. Um, in an influential 1973 article, John Hart Ely put the matter this way, Roe is bad because it is bad constitutional law, or rather because it is not constitutional law and gives almost no sense of trying to. This is in, this is in response to the court's 
um, decision that what, it, what the court, in, an, in a linguistically inventive way, called the penumbra of rights from which abortion was drawn. Those who dispute Roe find that the right itself was an invention, not just, the, not just its origins. Other scholars secure about the court's authority to, to deal with abortion have since suggested that women's right to control reproduction might more satisfactorily have been um, framed in terms of sex equality. Doctors, too, have made rights-based claims about abortion. Some argue that their right to practice medicine is infringed by statutes that require them, that prohibit certain methods of abortion or that require them to tell their patients that the fetus is a human being or that the fetus feels pain. Other doctors argue that they have a conscientious right not to participate in abortion at all or as medical students even to learn about it. 46 states have now enacted conscience clauses permitting physicians and other medical professionals such as nurses and pharmacists to refuse to participate in abortion-related services. Since 1996, federal law protects training <coughs> hospitals from the loss of federal funds if they choose not to provide abortion training in obstetric residency programs as required by the accrediting board for medical schools. And of course, in addition to states' rights and doctors' rights and women's rights, there are vigorous and important claims made on behalf of the fetus that it too has rights and interests. Indeed, many pro-life supporters would say that abortion is really only about an embryo or fetus's right to develop until birth, its right to life, and the rest is just noise. Whether the fetus has constitutional rights or moral rights or any other claim to respect, there is no question about its centrality in any discussion of abortion in the United States today. Fetal life now competes with, or perhaps has overtaken, pregnancy as the operative essence of what abortion is about. Abortion is also about religion, and for some is it, ab it is about sin. Quoting Pope John Paul II, among all the crimes which can be committed against life, procured abortion has characteristics making it, together with infanticide, an unspeakable crime. Accordingly, during the 2008 presidential campaign, the Catholic Bishop of Boston urged priests to deny Holy Communion to Senator John Kerry for his support of legal abortion. And the Bishop of Colorado extended the ban to, quote, Catholics who vote for candidates that stand for abortion, explaining that, quote, Catholic politicians who advocate for abortion place themselves outside the full communion with the church and so jeopardize that their salvation. Catholic voters may suffer the same fateful consequences. Of course, not all religions take this position, uh, although some do outside of Roman Catholicism. Um, for now, my point is simply that abortion in the U.S. is often about religion and its influence. For others, morality is the key, whether informed by secular or religious precepts. The legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin has put the case in terms of the sacredness of human life, which he uh, uh, explained need not be understood as a theological category. Others anchor their views in definition of personhood or humanity. To be sure, moral propositions are not always advanced in the measured tones of philosophers. A Mississippi Supreme Court judge put the argument for morality rather differently in a 2001 opinion where he said, ever since the abomination known as Roe v. Wade became the law of the land, the morality of our great nation has slipped ever so downward to the point that the decision to spare the life of an unborn child has become an arbitrary decision based on convenience. For many, but I want to point out that for many, the decision to have an abortion can itself be considered a moral act, by which I mean that however difficult the decision, it is for some the, that some consider it the right thing to do. But let us return to arbitrary decisions based on convenience. For this assessment leads us to the matter of sex. For whatever else abortion may be about, it is certainly about that. Pregnancy is necessarily, in most cases, connected to sex, and attitudes about sex, with whom, how often, for what purpose, are tucked into positions on abortion, including legal positions. A good example is the law's differential treatment of pregnancy depending on what kind of sex brought it about. 
um, in the days when abortion was illegal, many states made an exception for pregnancies resulting from involuntary sex, rape, or incest. Even now, the rape exception still has currency. In 2011, 32 states which refuse as a general matter to pay for the abortions of Medicaid patients will do so in the case of rape or incest. Pregnancy resulting from voluntary sex is another matter, perhaps especially for teenagers. Um, there is a general consensus among uh, that the polls reveal that teenagers who get pregnant have been a bit too frisky for their own good and should not be able to have an abortion, quote, an arbitrary decision based on convenience, just because they want one. In contrast to other places, like all of Western Europe and Canada, where teenage sexuality is considered normal developmentally, teenage sex in the US is more often taken as a sign of trouble. This explains why sex education and contraception, contraceptive preparedness <coughs> have been regarded as provocative rather than prudent behavior. It also explains the popularity of parental involvement statutes, which I know you have in this state um, and in 30 others. These are laws that require uh, pregnant minors either to notify or get consent of one or both of their parents, different states have different schemes, uh, before they can consent to an abortion. And if they're unwilling to do so, they must petition a court uh, instead, uh, for, for petition a court for permission. So despite our highly sexualized culture, teenagers are not really supposed to do it. They are supposed to be the kind of daughter that their parents imagine them to be. Uh, and we might come back to that. OK. So <laughs> as parental involvement statutes illustrate, abortion is also and ferociously about legislative lawmaking. Since Roe was enacted in 1973, state legislatures have enacted thousands of statutes regulating abortion provision, procedures, and practice. And thousands more are on their way. I mean, literally thousands. Um, abortion is also increasingly the subject of popular vote, or what is sometimes called direct democracy, as personhood and other abortion-related matters appear on state ballot and referendum and initiative measures. In November 2008 alone, the voters in South Dakota, Colorado, and California were called upon to decide whether all abortions should be banned, whether person begin, personhood begins at conception, and whether parental notification is a good idea. Mississippi, in the last election, just rejected a personhood amendment to its constitution. The point, however, is that all this voting by legislatures and citizens marks <coughs> abortion as an inherently political subject a political and unsettled subject, one whose legal status is subject to near perpetual review. Of course, that abortion is about politics and the politics of lawmaking is hard to miss in the US, and I think it's going to be very hard to miss in the next six months, um, where office seekers from school board members all the way up regularly campaign in, uh, usually campaign in being in opposition to legal abortion. In states that elect their judiciaries, judges too run on the issue. Nothing could be clearer than the campaign for a Kentucky district judgeship. Jed Dieters is a pro-life candidate. Mr. Dieters lost the contest, but he was censured by the State Judicial Commission for making statements that committed or appeared to commit him with respect to issues likely to come before the court. And one of the issues they cited was judicial bypass hearings, minors coming to him for permission to, uh, for, to judge their maturity. Um, he, was, uh, he was censured, and the court noticed that Dieter had, quote, freely testified that any good Catholic is pro-life, that Kenyon County has a high percentage of Catholic voters, and that his statement would hopefully give him a distinct edge in the race since you're in it to win. You do what it takes. This that statement gives us a sense of the nature and scope of abortion realpolitik. Because whatever one's religious or moral views, <clears throat> there is also the strategic use of abortion um, that one can put into play when you are in it to win. Um, I also wanted to say abortion, uh, and this is just a part that I've been thinking about recently, abortion is also about national identity. So for example, um, uh, in Ireland, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a matter of it's a matter of pride and content increasingly contentious, but that we are not a country that has abortion. 
compare Cuba, which is very proud that as a matter of sex equality, abortion is freely granted. Um, in some of the Eastern European countries, after 1989, they began to reassert their old rules against abortion, having, which, which became a kind of nationalistic view. We've shucked communism, and we're going back to how we really are. And I've just begun to think about this as abortion being about national identity in certain countries. So I haven't more to say about that. But um, there is, in addition to, to polit politics and policies, a more intimate way to characterize what abortion is about. Abortion is a deeply personal decision that over a million women make each year. Almost a third of all women will have an abortion at some point in their reproductive lives. That 30-year stretch in which pregnancy is possible over and over and over again. The number of women who have thought about abortion is likely larger. For over 4 million women in the US have babies each year, and certainly some of them will have considered doing otherwise. Even Sarah Palin, pregnant with her fifth child at 44, acknowledged what she described in her autobiography as the fleeting thought. Indeed, she says, I'm out of town. No one knows I'm pregnant. No one would ever have to know. So as I said, abortion decisions are deeply personal ones that women make one at a time and very privately in most cases as women confront pregnancies that either are or over time become unwanted. And I think that's a very important point to keep in mind. We think pregnancies are wanted or unwanted. But in fact, sometimes wanted pregnancies become unwanted, either because of um, prenatal testing or because the boy who is going to marry you is not. Uh, and, the, and, and so pregnancy moves out of categories. These aren't, these aren't rigid. These aren't, these aren't fixed. So abortion is therefore about all the things that women consider as they assess the place of a child and the meaning of motherhood in their lives at a particular moment in time. These include her faith, her finances, her plans, her aspirations for the future. They also often include an assessment of her relationship with existing or non-existing partners, as well as her relationship and obligations to her existing children. After all, one third of all women who have abortions are mothers already. Thus, abortion is not about abstract concepts of motherhood. Is it, an, it is an unflinchingly concrete decision about intimate relations and family composition. How many children there are to be and whether a particular man is to become a father and possibly a husband or partner as well. Because we're talking here mostly about women's lives, abortion is also necessarily about gender. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It is about gender both in terms of who gets to make the ultimate decision, she does, and how and with whom her decision and its consequences are negotiated, which is often a more complicated matter. Um, as the Supreme Court uh, has uh, observed, many people uh, no, never mind the Supreme Court. I'll just say, um, many people believe there is a natural order to the world with men and women occupying distinctive and appropriate roles. This includes childbearing and child re rearing for women. And if one feels anxious or nervous about that, abortion is a deeply unsettling phenomenon. Uh, control over reproduction can be everything in the scheme of, uh, of, of gender roles. And sometimes it's hard to remember that, unless, of course, you find yourself pregnant, in which case it, the issue comes to the fore. Um, I want to say that um, the, the gender roles of child rearing and child bearing also implicate issues of contraception. And that's, I'm not talking about contraception today, but I think that's a necessary part of any discussion in anxiety over gender roles. And we get a clue about the fears about disrupting social roles in states where contraception is also sought to be restricted, as well as abortion, if there are such states. Um, OK. All right. Uh, now, I'm working on, in thinking about gender, I've been working on a chapter now called Fathers and Fetus. I'm writing a book called About Abortion. And um, I've been working on a chapter called Fathers and Fetuses. And in it, I'm considering what we, might, what we know about how men might make abortion decisions. 
what factors they would consider in figuring out their responses to an unwanted pregnancy by looking at what men have done in frozen embryo cases. That's about as close as we can get to a man having control over an embryo. Uh, and there are a little bundle of, of, uh, of embryo cases. I'm not posing the question, what would men do if they were pregnant? Because I think if men were pregnant, they would be women. And then <laughs> we, we wouldn't want them, they, we, you know, then, so we'd just be in a kind of reverse. So I'm trying to look at, um, trying to shake the gender out of, of the abortion decision and think about it as a parenting decision and look at what men seem to care about when they decide in the cases where they do to, to defrost uh, embryos. Um, and, and my hope is that, well, and, and if the assessments turn out to be similar, then we might untether abortion from it, the deeply anchored, the deeply gendered anchor of motherhood and consider, again, if only for a minute, what abortion regulation would look like if its subjects were men. In this regard, as the Supreme Court itself has suggested, the availability of legal abortion sits as a kind of cosmic wallpaper against with all, all sorts of other decisions, decisions about jobs, decisions about relationships, are made all the time by men as well as women. In Planned Parenthood uh, versus Casey, in the stare decisis part of that decision, the court assessed the everyday impact of Roe and concluded that for two decades of economic and social developments, People, ha people, people have organized their intimate relationships and made choices that define their views of themselves and their places in society in reliance on the availability of abortion in the event that contraception should fail. So the court decided not to overrule Roe in great part because, quote, so many people had ordered their thinking and living around that case. And here they talk about men and women. Um, <clears throat> so I think for now we just need to take judicial notice of the accepted relation between abortion law and how ordinary reproductive people are able to go about their lives. Now each of these characterizations about what abortion is about, medicine, religion, law, politics, sexual culture, the organization of intimate relations, the shape of a woman's life, each of them provokes its own set of anxieties and controversies. <clears throat> Within medical schools, there are debates about whether abortion should be a required subject or an optional one. And it's quite interesting to think about that. In places where there, are very few, where there is little medical provision, one would think that just to know how to do a regular old DNC would be an important thing for doctors to know when they're the primary caretakers of, of a, a huge area of of patients, but it's not required. Within law, parties argue about how to square a woman's right to abortion with the First Amendment rights of sidewalk protesters urging her not to. And within religion and moral philosophy, theologians and scholars worry that the language of dignity may be poisoned or consecrated in the abortion debate. Things get more complicated and often more contentious when conceptions of abortion from one sphere or discipline bump into another. Um, these collisions happen all the time and in sort of kaleidoscopic combinations. Rights and religion, medicine and morality, commerce and culture, you know, what, pro what sponsors of television programs will drop the, the program if, the, if someone on the program contemplates <coughs> an abortion. Legislatures and courts, gender and law, politics and everything. So this is all to say that abortion is all about us, fervently contested throughout the color, cu culture as citizens try to persuade one another to recognize or reconsider what abortion is really about and to encourage others to incorporate that better view into their own beliefs and behaviors. Now, I want to move from these categories, <coughs> these categories into which abortion fall to the general question about talking about abortion. It's not an easy subject to talk about. And this is so at the level of lawmaking, as well in more personal realms, among friends, within families, between partners. The difficulties of discussion have connected and reinforcing clauses. <clears throat> there is, just for starters, the basic problem of vocabulary. Termination of pregnancy or abortion. Fetus or unborn child. Pregnant woman or mother. The choice is not only a matter of politics or philosophical outlook, but one of, often one of context. 
few people, I suspect, including few pro-choice people, when handed an ultrasound scan by an eager friend or cousin, are likely to offer congratulations on the friend's fetus. You know, it just isn't in the spirit of the moment, and it misses the occasion when news of a wanted pregnancy is shared. To be sure, prenatal life is not always referred to in just one way, embryo or the other, child, even by the same people or even, by, even regarding the same pregnancy. The vocabulary of reproduction often progresses in stages. Couples move into the language of pregnancy as the pregnancy, as into the language of baby as the pregnancy develops, provided that the pregnancy is coming along well. Couples undergoing prenatal diagnostic testing not uncommonly distance themselves from the language of baby uh, until they know, um, until they have received test results and, <clears throat> uh, ha and have decided how to proceed. That phrase as a gentler substitution for deciding whether or not they want to have an abortion. Now, another reason abortion is hard to talk about is that although it has been the subject of loud public debate for 40 years, at a personal level, abortion, it remains a private matter, a woman's alone to discuss or reveal. Whatever else abortion may be, sin or blessing, impossibility or necessity, a source of sadness or a source of relief, it is also a matter of the body, real, intimate, and physical. And for this reason alone may not be the stuff of common or casual conversation. As anthropologist Rosemary Cecil observed with regard to miscarriages, Pregnancy loss is frequently accompanied by a considerable amount of physical pain, blood, and mess. And this is not the sort of thing we talk about with others uh, usually. Um, uh, there are other reasons abortion isn't talked about. As a supreme, <coughs> pardon me, in addition to the intense physicality of it, women are also reluctant because the costs of talking about it are often perceived as high. As the Supreme Court recognized in Casey, some pregnant women fear, fear physical restraint or punishment. Indeed, this anchored the court's holding that spousal, Pennsylvania's spousal notification statute created a substantial obstacle to obtaining uh, an abortion, just about the only time they have done. Talking about abortion puts women at reputational risk. Is it possible to imagine an American woman politician or professor or dinner guest or employee mentioning that she has had an abortion at some point in her life? Maybe. I don't think so. I've always thought that abortion served as um, the thing that would do women politicians in, uh, just the way an affair sometimes does men politicians in. But, but that, but that is, it, it is not something we talk about. And I must say, now that I've been living in England, people don't drop having an abortion, but they might say, I went with my friend to the National Health Service. I mean, they, it is not taboo in the same way. And I think that's quite interesting. It, it, there is less reputational, there's, one has less to lose. It's considered a normal thing that might happen to a woman in her reproductive years. Um, in recent years, perhaps particularly among the young, having an abortion is taken as, as an indication of bad character. But whether that's for its revelation of sexual activity, of reproductive unpreparedness, or of basic immorality, I'm not sure. Some argue that this sort of trend of younger people um, having the, the uh, opposing legal abortion in greater numbers, some have referred to that as the luxury of legality, that um, if you've got it, you might not know what you're missing if it, if it, if it were to be illegal. Not too much on this. Even among um, women who terminate their pregnancy on account of fetal defects, there are hierarchies of acceptable reasons and preferred language, and the word abortion is usually not among them. Um, Ayelet Waldman, a writer in a book called Bad Mother, The Chronicle of Maternal Crimes, Minor Calamities, and Occasional Moments of Grace, uh, explained that she had an abortion because there were fetal defects in her child, and uh, when she joined the online abortion group Heartbreaking Choices, her willingness to describe her abortion as an abortion was not welcome. Um, the thought was that if you have an abortion for sort of sympathetic reasons of, of, uh, of, of fetal illness, you, you haven't really had an abortion uh, because the word itself is so tainted. So in thinking about the reticence around abortion talk, I want to distinguish between privacy, 
or what I, abortion privacy, and what I think of as abortion secrecy. And I have another chapter called Abortion Privacy, Abortion Secrecy. I think that privacy is the right to keep something to oneself. And secrecy is something more like the need to keep something to oneself for fear of what will happen, for fear of the consequences of not doing so. I think the two are distinct forms of concealment. The first is a source of control or power, and the second, it seems to me, something that is imposed and more isolating. Um, for now, I just want to note that women's inability to talk about abortion has a price. Just as in the not so distant past, the inability to talk about breast cancer or infertility or homosexuality or depression also had a price. This is so not only in terms of the relief and the companionship that talking sometimes provide, but also of, an, of interest to us as lawyers in, the term, in terms of the quality of the discussion as it relates to lawmaking. Um, I want to argue that as with other topics that have dared not speak their name, we cannot regulate without a more thorough or accurate sense of what we're regulating. It is hard to imagine, for example, the possibility of same-sex marriage as a, as a legislative move when the word homosexual was itself unutterable and the word gay meant only cheerful. So talking more openly about abortion is particularly important when so much regulation is premised on certain views, particularly that abortion and its supposed aftermath is what harms women rather than its demonization or regulation. So this is to say that at present public discussion about abortion is too often incomplete or coded or proceeds with an aura of mistrust even about the choice and meaning of words. Certainly there have been grounds for mistrust. Pregnancy crisis centers listed under the yellow pages under abortion services turn out to be pro-life anti-abortion counseling agencies that help arrange adoptions. Alabama's mandatory ultrasound statute is called the Women's Right to Know Bill. Um, our interest here is less the title of the statutes than their content, although it's impossible impo not to appreciate the rhetorical wallop of the Unborn Child Pain Prevention Act. Um, this tells us something about the ways and, and the means that lawmakers choose to regulate abortion providers and patients. Um, so what might a public conversation look about abortion look like if the collective we took a deep breath, dusted ourselves off, and considered anew that values and topics that constitute talking about abortion? Now I'm not talking about consciousness raising, that old feminist idea, though there are worse ideas. Um, if a third of all women will have had an abortion by age 45, Everyone must know someone who's had an abortion, yet I suspect lots of people, perhaps mostly men, don't think they do, and so they believe the issue has never touched their own life. Um, my aim is not some, and my aim in thinking we need to improve the quality of talking is not some sort of cheerful gesture towards compromise. I doubt very much that there is some kind of harmonic convergence hovering that's ready to sort out the abortion issue if we just listened more carefully. Nonetheless, to the extent that there is sense and profit in talking about abortion and its regulation, as there must be in a society that takes both the process of lawmaking and the well-being of citizens seriously, there is more to say about abortion, and this seems a good time to do it. I just want to ask you um, about our time. But you don't know how much I have left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so let me put a proviso in. To be clear, in urging that we sort of dust ourselves off, I do not mean that we should start all over again and unwind the basic holding in row. I proceed with abortion's basic legality firmly in place. I do this because there is always going to be abortion. And the question, it seems to me, is whether we're going to have it legal and regulated or not. But even so, even assuming abortion's legality, there's much to discuss about the shape that the legality has taken and the nature of regulation. And to that end, what I, do, what I mean to do in this book is take very seriously that in assessing what is at stake in abortion, each side should take more serious, seriously 
the deepest concern of the other. This has gotten me into a great deal of trouble with everybody, <laughs> both sides. But anyway, I'm, per I'm, I'm, I'm persevering. Now, to me, this means considering aspects of abortion that are often avoided, deflected, or rejected outright in existing conversations. Most specifically, for those who support legal in abortion, this includes acknowledging the importance of fetal life to those who oppose it. For those who want, and for those who want to recriminalize abortion, this includes engagement with women's lives, which I think is something that falls out and the unique constraints that involuntary reproduction uh, uh, poses. Now, let me get, say a bit about, 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 a little bit more about that. I think one of the problems with the debate has been that, um, but what exactly are the deep concerns of each side that seem to go unacknowledged? I've already suggested two. For those who oppose legal abortion, the heart of the matter is the unassailable, for them, moral status of fetal life from the moment of conception. From the pro-choice side, the cherished value is the quality of women's lives. But in urging that each side pay more attention to the others, it is worth pausing for a moment why this hasn't happened in the past. Um, I begin with dismissals of the pro-life position on fetal life. The view that personhood starts at conception has been challenged for a number of reasons. Some are biological, the question of what level of neurological development makes you a person. Others have a theological basis, the historically um, changing views on ensoulment. And still others are more philosophical in nature. For us lawyers, there's also been concern that to acknowledge there might be something to feed a life, anything to it, uh, that it might have a claim to characterization as a living thing, has risked conceding the core of the case against abortion, which is to say that it is murder. Um, and so there's been a kind of advocate's view that you can never acknowledge there's anything to this position that there's something, there might be something to fetal life because it's, it's giving away, it's giving away the store, is that the, giving away the store. Now, I'll say more about that, but there's one argument about pro-life position that gets us nowhere in terms of talking about abortion. And this is the argument that pro-life people cannot mean what they say when they say a human fetus is the moral equivalent of a human child. This argument is made by Ronald Dworkin in his important 1993 book, uh, Life's Dominion. Dworkin is concerned about the highly ambiguous claim, his phrase, that, quote, the scalding rhetoric of the pro-life movement seems to presuppose that the fetus is, from the moment of conception, a full moral person with rights and interests equal in importance to any member, any other member of the moral community. Um, what both sides really believe, says Dworkin, and would understand they believe if they only thought about it a bit more, is that all forms of life have innate value and, in this sense, are sacred. Now, his argument about sacredness may, in fact, identify what truly bothers people about abortion. But it is less the soundness of the argument for sacredness that troubles me than Dworkin's view about what people really think. The problem is not tone, although I think no one is ever really thrilled about being told what they really think. Rather, I think Dworkin is wrong about what many pro-life people think, which is that fetal life may well be sacred and that fetal life is a human person from the moment of conception. I don't think this was necessarily so 30 years ago, but the fetus has made great inroads in the culture in the last 30 years. We can all, ch little children can identify fetuses you know, can identify the little shape. There's been, a, there's been, this has been a huge change due in great part to the prevalence of ultrasound and the passing and the famili familiarity with visual images. Um, <clears throat> but let me read you something. Consider uh, about this, this is acceptance of, of, of fetal life as, <clears throat> a, as what people believe. Um, there's a dramatic opening of natural of a book called a, uh, Embryo, A Defense of Human Life, written by Robert George, a philosopher at Princeton, and his co-writer Christopher Tollefson. George describes how little Noah Benton Markham was, quote, one of the youngest residents of New Orleans to be, to be saved from Katrina. And 
Uh, turns out that Noah was nearly drowned in the hurricane's floodwaters, but in the end was rescued through the heroic efforts of 10 emergency responders. This is all to the good, right? It turns out that Noah, at the time of his rescue, was an embryo floating with 1,400 other frozen embryos in a canister of liquid nitrogen. George and Tolleson conclude that, quote, if those officers had never made it to Noah's hospital, there can be little doubt that the toll of Katrina would have been 1,400 human beings higher than it already was. Now, I, myself, have huge doubts about calculating Katrina's death toll this way. I think frozen at 1,400 frozen embryos and not little children would have been lost had the nitrogen can canister gone under which is not to say that frozen embryos have no intrinsic value. But I have no doubt that Robert George, a sophisticated natural law scholar, believes that embryos are persons and is, are endowed with exactly what Ronald Dworkin finds it impossible to believe they have. And I think it is not possible to talk to Robert George or others about abortion, as I believe it is important to do, without accepting that his position on the matter is exactly what he says. Um, well, I'll, I'll speak for about five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Without question, though, certain demonstrations of fetal personhood are hard to take. In 2011, two fetuses testified before an Ohio legislative committee in support of a bill banning abortion after the detection of a fetal heartbeat. Witness, the witnesses' mothers hooked up to ultrasound machines, and the images were projected onto a giant screen so that committee members could see and hear the amplified heartbeat pulses. <laughs> Now, to many, widescreen fetal testimony may seem more like political showmanship um, than anything else. But it is neither just political showmanship at one end of the persuasion scale, nor philosophical argumentation at the other that, create, that produces the increasing natural, naturalness of treating fetuses as persons in, one way, in, in ways that at one time would have seemed preposterous. Um, this is because, in addition to whatever biological criteria the fetus meets for humanness, it has come to possess the social attributes, if not the biological attributes, of a child. Um, a mixing set of reinforcing practices and beliefs launched and elaborated through fetal imagery um, has led to the realization, the making real, of fetuses as child. Not only as a generic bumper sticker, I'm a child, not a choice, but often as a participating member of the family. Within weeks of conception, many fetuses have a known sex, a name, a scrapbook, and a page on Facebook. <laughs> this is to say that in wanted pregnancies, social birth often precedes biological birth. And we're all accustomed to this. Um, the phenomenon, uh, so, so even, and even though social birth is not a legal category, it affects how we think about law. Now, I, I will just, um, what is it that the pro-choice -cho side um, fails to neglect? I think it is the quality of women's lives and their right to live in the world as full persons. Um, the argument is that this more complete and equal manner of being, of negotiating one's life, is impossible without control over reproduction. Um, and I think what we need to do, and I won't spell this out too much here, is we need to expand our sense of the harms at stake. Much attention has been paid to the harms women suffer when they're unable to get abortions or when they're unable to get legal abortions. But there has been little attention, little public discussion on the harms women suffer by virtue of abortion regulation, of what it means to have to look at the ultrasound of your fetus, of having to wait 24 to 48 hours, of having to travel, of having to, to put up with the thousands of regulations. And um, I think that that omission is problematic if we're after a richer account of the stakes for women in abortions regulation uh, at law. What I think, and I, I, won't, I won't say more about this, is that what abortion regulation, I think, does, and I think it's meant to do this in many cases, is to use the process, the informed consent, which is what this all falls under, as a kind of punishment. We can't stop you from having an abortion, but we can certainly make you pay for it. We can just throw a little patch, a little bit of humiliation in here, a little bit of, um, uh, yes, a little bit of humiliation. And I know you've all read about 
vaginal ultrasounds and, and how those are now a couple of states, instead of having just tummy wands, now uh, require vaginal ultrasounds. And I was talking to a friend about this and she said, you know, I had to have some surgery and I had to have a vaginal ultrasound. She said, that's a long way from nothing. <laughs> and I thought that was a very <laughs> helpful way to, to describe what, what it is. Um, so I'll just end by saying that much current legislation takes as its starting point that women don't understand what they're doing when they decide to end a pregnancy. And that's why they have to be told when human life starts that this is their fetus and so on. Um, in fact, much of it assumes that women are dangerous uh, and, and potentially murderous, unthinking creatures who do not understand what is at stake in their decision. The discussion here is guided by a very different premise. I believe that women, even young women, understand very well what an abortion is. They understand that an abortion ends pregnancy and if they have an abortion, they will not have a baby. That is the point. The significance of an abortion decision may differ from women to woman or girl to girl. And in deciding whether or not to continue a pregnancy, each will draw upon her own sensibilities, circumstances, and beliefs. But as with other deeply intimate decisions and com commitments, who to marry, whether to pray, how to vote, I maintain that women themselves are best able and best positioned to decide what is at stake. Um, what is at stake for them? And what is, uh, that is to say, what is at stake for, I credit women with understanding what abortion means, what it means for the fetus, and what it means uh, for them. And I think this would be a good place to stop. Thank you. Agreed to take a couple of questions. Um, before she does, I'd like to take the prerogative of first thanking you for doing this lecture series proud. But secondly, and more importantly, in, in my view, taking what is a very difficult, emotionally charged subject and, and, and really approaching it in a dispassionate and a balanced way so that all of us can decide how we come out, not with a knee-jerk or a reflexive reaction, but hopefully with a more um, intelligent um, assessment of the considerations. And the last thing I'll say before I open it up is I'm told, I have an iPhone 4, not a 4S, so I don't have Siri. But I'm told if you ask Siri, where is the nearest jack-in-the-box, it will tell you, go right on Speedway, 1.5 miles. And if you ask it, where is the nearest abortion clinic, it will say, I do not understand your question. Um, so this is a tough issue in society today. That said, um, we have um, individuals with microphones. If anybody has questions, we will also shortly be continuing the discussion. For those of you, like me, who aren't going to dinner, with a, a nice reception across the um, courtyard, but we, um, we do want to give you um, an opportunity for a question or two if they're out there. This lady in the... Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Um, I agree with our dean uh, that this is... Uh, <laughs> I disagree with our dean. <laughs> That's a first, no. One of the, the issues um, that abortion comes up in is in pop population demographics. I don't know if that's going to be part of your book mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Because around the world and internationally, you have the state intruding into women's bodies, and it's accepted in some societies. One child policy, uh, regulation of women's menstrual cycles, handing out birth control pills. It's a kind of a level of intrusion that I don't think anybody here in the United States would tolerate. Yeah. But, but isn't there another line, and you mentioned it in different terms, but this idea of compulsory reproduction. Because if you have de demographics that are changing, um, some, some countries in Europe are offering financial incentives for the pro procreation, creating babies. And what happens here? Um, this kind of state intrusion and state decision-making on abortion 
uh, and not taking it away from the uh, individual woman's choice, what prevents that next step from sterilization, from compulsory reproduction in order to go ahead and making sure we have enough workers, for example? So. But are you, uh, are you saying that we have both, in, we're, states are both incentivizing procreation and, non, and abortion, both yeah. ways? Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, so the last chapter of this book, which certainly isn't written, is called Abortion Here and Elsewhere. And <clears throat> that I'm just beginning to think about which elsewheres I want to look at. Um, when I was teaching a class on abortion um, about two, three years ago, I, it was a seminar, and I had a student from China. And she sat there somewhat, per, I don't know, she didn't say much. And then one day, like a light bulb went on in her head. And she said, oh, I never understood what this class was about. <laughs> she said, but I have two, but she said, now I do. She said, you have God, which was very interesting to me. And she said, you have God as this extra, I mean, and then, and then later she was defending and someone said, well, what about your one child policy? And she said, um, well, clearly no one in the class had ever tried to get on a bus in Beijing. <laughs> and the, her classmates were horrified that bus crowding could seem like a justification for, abor for population control. But I think, I, I, I thought that was a, I didn't really know, quite know what to do at the moment. You know, I knew it was a teaching moment when I wasn't <laughs> sure which way to go. And, but but I, thought, I thought that it was this, um, to go to your point about demographics, there was just an ar uh, in China, there, there was just an article saying that Chinese policemen are now advertising for wives online, and they're importing them, overcoming certain racial preferences, because there are no women. Now I thought, you know, that's a, that's a surprise. Of course, you know, I mean, no, so it's an example of what you're talking about. Um, and then we have the under, we have the, the under, pop, the, the, the uh, what do you call it when the population doesn't reproduce itself? Negative, Negative of, of all of Europe. So I don't know, I'm, I'm really focusing, I, I'm, I'm not taking on such a big question as population, but, it, and, which is very interesting because it used to be that, a, and, and so are many other people not doing so. Because it used to be that zero, what is it called, ZP, zero population growth, used to be a movement that people knew about. It was part of why you wanted abortion. And that seems to have fallen out in the discussion as this kind of morality has overridden the thought of that, of sort of global responsibility in terms of population. So I'm really just a local girl, um, just working on the US. But I think maybe I should attend more to the, the, the comparisons. I hope we'll talk about it more, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering when the day will come when people recognize the right of privacy of women and all this talk about abortion and regulation, et cetera, it's nobody else's business but hers. When is that day coming? Not in our lifetime. <laughs> I'm old. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, there's been, so these changes, um, one of the things I've noticed is a sort of generational difference in thinking about abortion. And I think that women 50 and above have one view, and that, and, and so I've been thinking about this. What, why is there not a greater, just what you said, that this is a, we can add the doctor in. You're not supposed to self-abort, but between you and your doctor, you can decide this. And I've been, one of the things I've thought about is we have this massively confessional culture, you know, with everybody spilling their guts about everything, except about abortion. But I think it adds to the sense that everything is everybody else's business. Uh, that's one small factor. The other is the, the so what I, so one of the, so in terms of the election and so on, I've often thought the worst thing that could happen to those who favor recriminalization would be for the Supreme Court to overturn Roe. Because it's wonderful to have legal abortion there as something to hate and as something to stand for everything that's wrong with everything. 
you know. Um, so so that's I'm, that's a bit of that's not really responsive to what you said, but the idea of the idea of privacy on on women on women is really the, the, interesting. And the flip is because I teach every other year. One year I teach it on a mother of course on legal issues of motherhood, and the other on abortion. And the other thing about women's bodies and privacy is when you're pregnant, there's a great sense that people can touch you. You know, somehow you've become property of the yeah. culture and people don't hesitate to touch pregnant women or touch their tummies in a way that they would not touch anyone else. So that's something, I don't know, I have to think about this. It's extremely interesting, but I think you've got it just right. Um, behind, yeah, or wherever. Buddy had a question as well. The, um right of a woman to privacy. What about the right of all of us to privacy and end of life decisions? Can yes. it be paralleled yes. politically, socially, ethically with end of life, assisted suicide, that type of thing? Yes, I do. And um, were we talking about this? Barbara, were we talking about this? Uh, probably. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I do. But what I, but I do. Um, so there are several ways to slice it. One is deciding who gets to decide. The other are um, sort of the state's position on it. So like pro-life as a position, but pro-life, but pro-death penalty. I mean, there's several ways to cut up the, whole, the issues of life and death. And I, I do think, and I think that the, all the support, I mentioned Terry Schiavo in these remarks, so that was driven in great part by, I mean, there's been analyses of it, by people who are interested in abortion. But it, it is quite the same one and who had the same issue. I mean, who, who and, and I don't know whether you think this is also a matter of privacy. Yes, that one gets to decide. So I think that's right. It's not particularly where I'm working, but, but I should connect with someone. Right. Yes. Let's do one more. Uh, do you think, um, what do you think about uh, male politicians, religious figures who are using power to put down, to control women that if they had to bring up the child, they would think differently? What do I think about that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I think about that. I mean, I think that it goes to what I'm, so in these pros and embryo cases that I'm looking at, it's very interesting. There's a, a famous case from Tennessee where the man says, he, you know, that these are cases where people create an embryo, then they get divorced, and they, the, one of them doesn't want to have it anymore. And the man says, I, I grew up in a, I, I, one, they don't want to have a relationship with a partner anymore, which I think people forget about in abortion as being very important. You're not just having a child, but you're also establishing a, a horizontal relationship with someone. Um, but he said, I, I grew up in a broken family, was how he put it, and I don't want my children raised this way, and I don't want my children being raised by strangers, which I thought was quite interesting. So it was about what control over not raising them as being a ground for, for saying, I don't want that fetus implanted, in, that, that embryo implanted in anyone. Um, yes, there's a very funny movie, if I dare say this, about abortion um, called Citizen Ruth. I don't know if anybody's seen it with Laura Dern, and she plays this sort of alcoholic street wreck person, and she's pregnant. And when they tell her she's pregnant, she says, Good God, what a calamity. That's, uh, that's what it's, and she's, she's taken upon um, the, 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 by pro-life and pro-choice groups. And they're both caricatured. And they're both pulling her. And I think Burt Reynolds is the head of the <laughs> pro-life group. But it's, it, 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 it plays with the sort of thing you're asking about. And, and, it, and it's, it's, it's maybe 15 years old. But, it, but things that in the movie were just imagined are now legislated, are now laws. So, you know, look at look, a mandatory ultrasound, for example. So, yes, I think that goes to the gender point, that, that it is impossible. I, I, I don't know whether men feel it's a calamity if their girlfriend tells them they're pregnant. But I know that for women, it, put, it can put a stop on your whole life. 
and it isn't, uh, yeah. I, 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 I was talking with a, a woman who does abortions, a doctor in New York last week, and she said that what was very interesting to her was the sort of things that were making clients come to her, these were mostly poor women, were they lost their housing or their boyfriend left them. I mean, they were, they were interesting. They weren't, they weren't, I'm gonna get my law degree you know, and I can't be interrupted. They were, they were issues of, of, of surviving, really, and that they felt another child would put them under. So I think that's all hugely important. And in other countries, the, such as England, you can have social reasons. You know, the, the part of what entitles you to an abortion is a recognition of the social, the social um, circumstance of the mother, of the woman. So. Well, I, I know there's more questions out there, and I apologize, but uh, I do want to say there is the opportunity to continue uh, the discussion at the reception, which Great. I really like to do. We've kept you on your feet long enough. Please join me one more time in thank thanking you. Professor Sam. Thank you.